Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we are here presenting the third seminar of the series of uh, 2021 of our dialogues on uh, ethology and behavioral ecology. Today I'm very happy uh, to be introducing this seminar by Sarah Marshall uh, Pescini uh, on uh, domestication effects on social cognition. Uh, I leave uh, to Eliz Professor Elisabetta Palagi to introduce Sarah Marshall. Elisabetta uh, was so kind to invite Sarah to give, a, to, to give this talk. So Elisabetta will uh, do my job in introducing Sarah. Thanks a lot, Sarah, and welcome. Thanks a lot, Alessandro. It is a great pleasure and a great honor to, in to me to introduce Sarah today. Sara Marshall Pescini graduated in psychology from St. Andrews University and obtained her PhD at the same university, working with Andrew Whiten on social learning in chimpanzees and children. Most of the work was carried out in Uganda, Africa, with both sanctuary and wild chimpanzees. After the PhD, she came back to Italy, her home countries, and work in Milan at the Milan University for eight years, setting up together with Emanuela Prato Previde a small but lively dog cognition lab. Since 2013, Sarah has joined the team at Wolf Science Center and the Conrad Lawrence Institute of Ethology uh, at the Veterinary University of Vienna as a senior scientist. Her research focuses on the social behavior of wolves and dogs. Since 2016, she co-supervised a couple of field studies, one focused on free-ranging dogs in Morocco and another studying wild wolves in the Italian Apennines. Sarah has published over 50 scientific papers, very good papers, in top journals in her field and co-edited a volume for Elsevier together with uh, Julian Kaminski, titled The Social Dog, Cognition and Behavior. I wish to thank Sarah for accepting to be part of this cycle of seminars and sharing with us her interesting data on one of the human's best friends. Thank you, Sarah. So thank you very much, Elisabetta, for that very uh, nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I hope I can uh, sort of give a presentation which will probably inspire lots of questions rather than answer um, a lot of questions. But I guess that is the nature of science, right? You set out and you start with some questions and then you get a little bit of answers, but actually you end up with more questions. Um, so I will now share the presentation um, and start with that. Let me just make sure that everything is working properly. We should be used to all this by now, after so long. Okay, so I hope you all see my uh, PowerPoint presentation. So the title of the talk today is Domestication Effects on Social Cognition, Wolves and Dogs Compared. So as you probably all know, um, the closest living relative of our best friend, the dog, uh, is the gray wolf. And this was suspected for a long time based on morphological uh, and archeological data. But in the late uh, 90s, uh, thanks to uh, a big effort um, on the side of the genomics and genetic analyses, this kind of fact was confirmed. Um, and what is uh, a little bit more difficult and where geneticists are still effectively not really reaching an agreement is where uh, the domestication event happened, whether it happened once uh, or more than once in different places. But where they do seem to sort of now come to a common agreement is that this initial event or uh, initial initiation of this process of domestication happened between 15 to 30,000 years ago. Now, as you can uh, imagine, it's still not a very small date, right? 15 to 30,000 years, there's still quite a, a big margin of what, what's happening. 
Um, but uh, at the moment, uh, this is some a common agreement. Um, yeah. So one of once this these facts are established, then one of the interesting aspects that has opened up a very lively uh, streak of research is what exactly changed uh, from wolves to dogs, especially in relation to their behavior and cognition. And what a kind of selective pressures uh, may have changed actually these uh, or shaped these changes uh, in our um, species, in, in the dogs. Um, and actually to be able to answer the question, one of the first things we have to really sort of think about is what is a dog? And I think for most people, it is almost impossible not to think about dogs in these terms. Uh, meaning that because we live in such close contact with domestic dogs, when we think about a dog, we think of our uh, pet, our golden retriever with whom we go play uh, ball in the afternoon. Or maybe we think about assistant dogs because we see them quite often with disabled people. Effectively, we think about an animal that lives in very close proximity and in very big dependence on humans. Whereas I think that the image that we have of a wolf is something which is far away in nature, um, in wide open spaces, an independent animal. Um, actually, an animal that would rather avoid humans. And if they do come across to humans, there is still the image of the wolf as an aggressive animal towards humans. So this, I think, is the main sort of um, thinking, instinctive thinking, uh, emotional thinking that we have. But actually not just the general emotional thinking. I think this kind of thinking of these two species has also been quite prominent uh, amongst researchers. Of course, researchers are human beings. So to a certain extent we have, uh, or to a large extent, we have the same biases and the same emotional thinking of you know, everybody else. So these, uh, the, 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 the way we imagine these two species, I think is something that is common also to researchers. And um, for probably because of this, and this is me a little bit interpreting, but probably because of this, quite a lot of domestication hypotheses that emerged uh, on what may have changed from wolves to dogs, kind of had this shift of image that I kind of represent with these two photos from something that is wild, dangerous, um, aggressive, shy maybe, but still um, with a sort of a, a very strong emotional and, and dangerous characteristic to this kind of somewhat fluffy and, um, you know, maybe a little bit um, simpler or not quite as smart um, animal that are, is our favorite uh, friend. And um, I mentioned here one of the most influential hypotheses that kind of fall into this um, thinking a little bit, but there are others. And the emotional reactivity hypothesis is a very interesting hypothesis that was put forward by um, uh, Brian Hare and Mike Tomazello. But I, I think it's more linked to Brian Hare. I mean, Tomazello also gave his, his um, thinking here, but it's really uh, Brian Hare's baby. And uh, what is really interesting is that they made a parallelism between the effect of domestication on dogs with a kind of self-domestication of humans. So they made this parallel that in the same way that we changed from our common ancestors with chimpanzees and became more tolerant and more cooperative and less aggressive and less fearful, in the same way dogs compared to wolves became more tolerant, um, less aggressive, less fearful and therefore more cooperative. And this is a hugely influential hypothesis. Um, I think also, and actually Elisabetta might be able to confirm this better, but also in the primate, especially in the primate world, but in general, it has been a very sort of influential hypothesis. And um, uh, Brian Hare and uh, Mike Tomazello really used the wolf-dog comparison as a, a sort of an element to uh, support this hypothesis. 
However, science never stands still, and the point of science is to question hypotheses. And um, we questioned the hypothesis as a group. Um, I am part of a very uh, lively and creative group where we like to question things. Um, and one of our initial thinking was, well, the starting point. The starting point is how we see these two species. And whereas I don't think we have much qualms on how uh, wolves are perceived, or not yet anyway, um, dogs, we were fortunate enough to have uh, uh, a lively group of postdocs, including uh, Simona Cafazzo, uh, who is Italian, who worked with free-ranging dogs. And uh, her and I joined the Wolf Science Center at the same uh, moment. And this was instrumental because Simona had worked with free-ranging dogs uh, in the outskirts of Rome. And her thinking of dogs was a little bit outside the box. Whereas our box was pet dogs, maybe shelter dogs, maybe working dogs, but we kind of forgot about free-ranging dogs. Her thinking was free-ranging dogs, pet dogs, free-ranging dogs, pet dogs. And so she introduced us to the world, if you want, of free-ranging dogs. And who are free-ranging dogs? Free-ranging dogs, differently from what we think, are not abandoned dogs. They are not, or they are not only abandoned dogs. They are not dogs that were pets and then, and then became um, uh, left by their owners to fend for themselves. No, 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 no. Free-ranging dogs in the majority of the world are a population of dogs that live alongside human with different levels of dependence uh, on humans for food, for example, for shelter. Um, but what is really interesting is that geneticists, for example, refer to the, these dogs as free breeding dogs. And what, why they refer to these dogs as free breed, breeding is because these dogs have their own choice of mates and this means that natural selection, however you want to define the term, humans are part of it, of course, but it's still natural selection, acts upon this species. And the, the world of free-ranging dogs can be enormously diverse, from village dogs that live inside towns that almost become, uh, you know, the dog of that specific area in a village, to dogs that live um, pretty much in the woods uh, almost self-sufficiently. Um, I'm not aware of any population that is completely self-sufficient. Most of the free-ranging dogs depend on human food. But there is a very wide variety. And in our thinking, we kind of thought, hmm, but maybe, maybe these dogs are actually a more interesting comparison uh, than the ones that uh, are normally used, which are pet dogs, because they open a new window of understanding on this species. And bear in mind that free-ranging dogs are between 75 and 80 percent uh, of dogs in the world. So actually, they are the vast majority of dogs. Uh, pet dogs are only a tiny portion of um, the dogs that live in our world today. So if we take this population as our study population, what kind of differences can we uh, see in the way that these dogs live compared to wolves? Now, first of all, a big difference is in their feeding ecology because wolves are obligatory hunters. If they don't hunt and don't kill, they die. So this is why it's obligatory hunters. They are cursorial hunters, meaning that they run after their prey until they exhaust the prey, and then they attack it. And they are group hunters. They hunt in group because being a cursorial hunter is a hell of a lot of work. So if there's more of you, there are more of you to be able to run down the prey and exhaust it. Um, and they, this kind of feeding ecology is a very high risk um, type of uh, endeavor because the success rates, and this is based on a number of different studies, go from 10 to 50 percent, meaning that only in 10 to 50 percent of the times that I try to hunt, I actually kill something. And this has led um, McNulty and um, Meech in America 
in their re most recent book, uh, Wolves on the Hunt from Yellowstone, to consider, to call, to refer to the feeding ecology as a feast or famish kind of situation. You either eat a lot because you have a big carcass or you're kind of starving for a few days. This is very different from the kind of feeding ecology of free-ranging dogs. Yes, they can hunt. Opportunistically, they do hunt. They tend to hunt smaller uh, prey. Sometimes they also hunt in groups, but the majority of um, their food comes from scavenging. And specifically, it comes from scavenging on human refuse. Although, actually, there was a very interesting study in Botswana where they found that in certain areas closer to villages, dogs would outcompete hyenas in, in actually their scavenging behavior on actual carcasses as well, animal carcasses. So it's, they, are, they are pretty efficient scavengers, but not such efficient hunters. And what is interesting is that the dependence on the human food uh, is also reflected in genetic modifications that allow them to um, digest starch and lipids much better than wolves. And in the very few, I and mean, there aren't that very many, in the very few studies that have looked specifically at what dogs eat uh, within the human refuse kind of category, what they found is that they are highly dependent on all the leftovers that we produce when we process maize or millet. And their sort of almost kind of favorite food is human feces. So we are actually um, automatic distributing machines of food for dogs. And this makes sense, although it sounds disgusting, because our feces contains a lot of rich protein, which the, for the dogs is uh, an incredible resource. Okay. What about their social ecology? Of course, feeding ecology and social ecology are strictly and quite often very closely linked. And because of the difference in social ecology, you actually see um, a lot of differences also in the social ecology of wolves and dogs. So wolves are monogamous. They um, pair and mate for life unless something horrible happens to one of them. Um, they live in family packs, meaning that uh, the older individuals do not disperse immediately. They have delayed disperse, dispersal, so they stay together with their parents for a few years. And in that time, they take care of their younger uh, brothers and sisters, so the puppies of that year. And how do they do this? Well, um, they take care of them playing and guarding them, but also regurgitating food. So, of course, hunting is a very dangerous um, uh, in, endeavor. So puppies can't follow uh, the adults uh, in the hunt. Um, they can only start following around seven to eight months, sometimes six months, but really seven, eight months. So during that first period, after the mother has finished lactating, the whole pack hunts together, the adults, eats goes back to the so-called rendezvous site, which is the area where the puppies are left, and then regurgitates food for the puppies or carries food back. So they have uh, what is called alloparental care, a high kind of uh, dependence on alloparental care. And there's some very interesting studies coming out of Yellowstone now that show that the uh, number of individuals in the pack is directly linked to hunting success in the sense of the diversity of species that can be hunted, um, so elk and bison and so forth, and also to puppy mortality. Okay, so the, 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 the pack takes care and increases the success rate, uh, the survival rate of the puppies. Um, another final aspect which is really important in the life of uh, wild wolves is intergroup conflict because um, the packs are highly, so one of the main reasons for mortality in Yellowstone is uh, being killed by members of another pack. Um, uh, conflict between packs can be extremely serious. And here again, the number of individuals in the pack is directly related to the success that they have 
in defending their territories from other packs. So all in all, this means that wolves are highly dependent on their pack. Yeah. Uh, now, what about free ranging dogs? They have a different kind of sociality. First of all, you can find free ranging dogs living alone. And you can find free ranging logs living in packs as big as 28 individuals, like the ones that Simona Cafazzo studied in Rome. So there's a huge variability there. When they do form packs, it is multi male, multi female packs. And the mating system is promiscuous, meaning that the female will mate with multiple males. She certainly has some criteria. So uh, again, Simona did a very nice study looking at this, what uh, her, the female mate choice and male mate choice. So it's not that they, uh, promiscuous doesn't mean that they mate indiscriminately, but it means that they choose to mate with multiple males. Mostly the, the care is just by the mother towards the puppies. There is very little alloparental care. There is a little bit, um, some, in some cases, especially in Indian free ranging dogs, they do see some, um, Per, uh, paternal and also grandmotherly care, but mostly it is maternal care. And the pups start pretty much after weaning, so at around two months, they start foraging alone because they can do so. They don't have to go hunt a huge big um, bison. Uh, for them, foraging means going around and looking for um, scraps of food, scavenging. So at two months, uh, the puppies we study in Morocco are already sort of running around looking for food, sometimes with mother, but actually quite often also alone. This means that in a, oh, and there's also reduced intergroup conflict. You still find intergroup conflict, and there's some, another very nice study by um, Roberto Bonanni, who worked also with Simona, that shows that also in, do in free-ranging dogs, there is a, a direct link between the number of individuals in the pack and the success in defending uh, your pack. But as far as we have seen in Morocco, and as far as I know, the level of intensity of the aggression between packs is much lower. It is mostly posturing and barking. And we have rarely seen, well, in one occasion in Morocco where we studied the free-ranging dogs, we saw a very severe attack that probably led to a, a lethal killing of another dog, but we don't know because we weren't able to find the body. But in general, I would say that there is um, less kind of uh, intergroup conflict. Now, this means that the two species have a different dependence on their packs. Now, based on this kind of thinking, we developed a couple of hypotheses of our own which of course are just waiting for someone else to come up and say that they don't agree and they have a better one because this is just the nature of science. Um, and the two hypotheses that we have been working on are the so-called canine cooperation hypothesis, which goes a little bit um, uh, against, if you want, to the previous hypothesis and actually says that, yes, dogs might be very cooperative with humans and, and we, we think they are, but this comes directly from the fact that wolves are highly social uh, and tolerant and cooperative with each other. So the suggestion there is effectively that dogs, during the course of the uh, domestication, were able to transfer skills, uh, cooperative skills that they already have, that they acquired from the wolves, to humans. And a little bit, our hypothesis there was that if you actually raise wolves uh, in such a way that you give them the possibility of seeing humans as social partners, our prediction based on this hypothesis would be that they would actually be as cooperative as dogs with humans. And the second hypothesis that was more based on this thinking about uh, free-ranging dogs and the differences that I just um, told you about in their social ecology and feeding ecology is that actually po potentially um, due to the lowered dependence on each other in dog packs compared to wolf packs, they would actually not be as good as wolves in uh, cooperating with conspecifics. And potentially also how tolerant they are around food has changed because wolves are all feeding on the same prey that they have actually hunted together. Dogs are scavenging around mostly by themselves actually when they go feeding, and they don't have this need to sort of work together and then effectively share the food together. OK, so then how do we test our hypothesis and how um, do we kind of come to a, a sort of a, an understanding of, of what is going on? 
So one of the biggest difficulty is, of course, if you compare a pet dog uh, living on a sofa with a wolf um, living in a zoo, then if you compare them, for example, on how well they cooperate with, with humans, this is a hugely unfair comparison because dogs are continuously exposed, to, pet dogs are continuously exposed to humans, uh, whereas, of course, zoo wolves not. And actually, it doesn't get much better if you decide that you just want to compare the wolves um, that are living in nature with the dog, free-ranging dogs, because wolves are enormously shy of people. They that this is something that we have kind of almost selected in them by exterminating most of them, especially in Europe. So also, this approach doesn't work if you're interested in seeing how they cooperate with humans, for example. So. Um, Basically, we need to neutralize the differences in the environment and in their fear of humans uh, and the human setting in order to then understand underneath that fear and when you get rid of the differences in the environment, what remains? What are the real differences that are there? And this is exactly why the World Science Center was born. And the World Science Center was set up by Shofi, Friki and Kurt. You see them up on the, on the right-hand side. Um, and the idea of the World Science Center was let's create an environment where we can raise wolves and dogs exactly in the same way and give them a lot of human exposure so that they see us as social partners and they are no longer fearful of us and of the experiments that experimental paradigms that we present to them. And then let's try and present all these experiments to them and see where the differences lie. Um, so the wolves and the dogs at the Wolf Science Center are hand raised from, the, from a very early age, from 10 days of age, and they grow up in peer groups. So the wolves are the wolves and the dogs are the dogs. So one year we raise wolves, the next year we would raise dogs. Well, no, luckily not every year, but every few years we do this, okay? And uh, they have, continuous contact with humans for the first five months of their life. By continuous, I mean every day, every night. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There is always someone living with them. So this uh, we know uh, from studies done in the um, 1970s and 80s from uh, by Zeman and Klinghammer and sort of the pioneers of wolf science is that if you do this very intensive uh, kind of um, raising and human habituation, then wolves do are able to see um, humans as their companion, as their social partners, and and lose some of their fear, a lot of their fear. So after these five months, wolves go and live in with other wolves in wolf packs, and dogs go and live with other dogs in dog packs, and they're always kept separate. And we are able to carry out all of uh, our studies because they have lost the fear of humans. Uh, and we are also able to observe them uh, whilst they relax in their own environment because, again, they don't, they're not fearful if a human comes by and sits for hours in front of their cage to watch their behavior. And, of course, they are given daily training uh, and cognitive test testing. And we test them on a lot of different tasks uh, that look at a lot of different aspects of the potential wolf-dog comparison. And of course, today I can't talk about everything. I'm just going to focus on one thing, which is cooperation. And cooperation is um, a very interesting topic uh, in human and also in animal behavior. And just to give you a definition, which is normally quite accepted in the animal community or in the animal uh, science community, um, how we defined cooperation is that two individuals work together to reach a common goal. And this is kind of the definition that I will use here. And to uh, work on this topic, we chose, um, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We chose something that was used uh, very, very much in many lots of different studies, uh, initially with chimpanzees by Hirata. Um, and it's a task which is called the loose string task or the string pulling task is another way. Um, and it is quite uh, ingenious. Uh, simple, but very ingenious. It's basically a tray uh, with a rope that goes through some hoops. It's just one rope, but you have two ends of the rope. Now, you want the tray to come towards you so that you can reach the food because you can't go to it. It's on the other side of the fence. But if you pull only on one side, 
the string just vroom, comes out. And so the, the tray does not move. If you pull both ends of the rope together, so you pull it together, then the whole tray moves forward and you can obtain the food. And of course, if you then put the two ends of the rope not close, but very far away, you can't reach it by yourself. So you need a partner. Now, this is the concept behind the loose string task. And it has been, as you can see from this slide, it has been used with many, many different species. So today, what I will present, and I might not be able to present everything, I tend to put too much material on my presentations, but I can stop at any point. Uh, I will present studies that we used using this paradigm, first with conspecifics, then with humans. Then we wanted to dig a, dip, a bit deeper and try to understand what the animals actually understood of this task, rather than just giving them the task. Um, and finally, we I would like to present, but I don't know if I'll get there, we did a meta-analysis on what factors are important for these animals. Are they cognitive factors or are they social factors that really help them succeed in this kind of test? So let's start with the conspecific cooperation. And here you see the people involved, Federike, of course. So Federike and I worked uh, very closely um, as part of the ERC, an ERC project that uh, she won, uh, which was specifically on cooperation. Um, and But for each study, you will also see a bunch of students because without them, all of this would not be possible. Uh, so in this, ca in this case, for these studies, it was uh, Jonas, Camille and um, Meglin who helped us. And the publications are underneath. So what did we do in this uh, study? So um, the first thing we decided to do was something that uh, I was terrified about. Because in most of the studies that have been done with string pulling, uh, with all the other species, you first give a little bit of training to the animals. So you basically train the animal that the name of the game, so the game of the string pulling task, is that you pull the string and the rope, you pull the rope and the tray comes close to you. And what you do is you put the two ends close so that the animal can take both of them. Then you put them a little bit further away so they get the idea. And then, boom, it's very, very far, and therefore you need a partner. So there is this kind of understanding, maybe, that they do need a partner. And Federica looked at me and said, pa, the wolves are going to do it. No, they don't need all this. They're just, just, you just, let's just throw them in. They're going to do it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is a recipe for disaster. But I trust her. She knows her animals. I had just started working with the wolves. So I was like, okay, maybe. But all right, I trust you. Let's do it. And then we can always do a step back. So this is always a fun thing, right? Try and test the things that are a bit difficult for the animals. And then if they fail, you can't frustrate them. So you then have to sort of, you know, recover. But let's try it a little bit difficult. And then if they fail, let's make it easier. But if they succeed, oh, we've learned something, right? So this is kind of the thinking. So we chose our dyads and we chose uh, uh, two individuals that like of the same pack, of course. So we only worked with individuals in the same pack. But we also chose them uh, in such a way that we knew they would they, they were two individuals that got along based on our observation data. So we had data for this, right? We knew the affiliation score and the rank uh, dominance of all our individuals. And we just threw them in. We gave them uh, six sessions of six trials with this task. And boy, I mean, okay, she was right. Federica was right. Um, in, effectively, five out of the seven dyads actually did succeed. They didn't have an amazing success, but they did succeed um, at, at least once. Um, quite a few diets actually succeeded more than once, but they did succeed one at least once with the wolves. The dogs was a different story. We only had one uh, diet that was able to succeed once. So, okay, fine. This was a bit too difficult for them. Oh, this is actually a video. Um, hopefully it works. This is Shiman Aragon. Uh, this is the first time that they are paired together, but not the first time that they do the task. Okay, so it's, it's not the very first time that they do the task, uh, but it's the first time that they do it together. And I apologize for the dancing uh, video, but it's kind of research videos, not, you know, uh, BBC documentary videos. So that's it. Uh, 
But this is just to give you an idea of the task. So they did pretty well. Okay, so, but now, now let's go back and do it properly. Uh, let's do, give them the training and then uh, try it again. So what we did is uh, each individual we trained to solve the task uh, by themselves with the ropes very close by and then a little bit further and then a little bit further up to about 10 centimeters. And then we put it very far and reintroduced their partners. Um, and in this case, what we found uh, was that uh, the wolves that had not succeeded previously now succeeded, uh, except for one diet. So one wolf diet continued to fail on the task. Uh, but the dogs still kind of struggled. Uh, only one uh, su diet succeeded out of six. And it, they only succeeded once. So this was not still sort of a bit puzzling for us because in our hypothesis, yes, we did expect wolves to do better, but we didn't expect the dogs to fail quite so badly. So we were a little bit sort of... Okay, I mean, the results kind of support our hypothesis. Great, this is nice. But what, what we couldn't quite figure out is what was going on because it felt like the result was almost kind of too good to be true. So what's going on? Um, so, okay, so here you just see the success rate, but this is boring. Uh, what we really wanted to look at is what's happening with the dogs. And I now have a video here. And what you will see is Azali and Bora coming close. Now, uh, Azali is the, the male here. And he pulls the rope and Bora comes close and sniffs, sniffs a bit, has a little social interaction with Azali, kind of looks at him. He's doing his thing, right? He's, he's the one who's manipulating the task. She almost picks up the rope but doesn't and then leaves, okay? He follows her and then he goes back and pees. This is marking behavior, right? Now she's he's blocking her, right? He's blocking her from accessing the table, yeah? Now, she, at a certain point, starts to have a little sort of fun and says, okay, let's try something else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw it on a play. I'm going to play a bit, see if this kind of relaxes him a bit, and maybe he's going to let me have a go at this. Oh, wait, he's, he's still doing the marking. So this is definitely my table, my, 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 my. Okay, let's just put it on the play. Let's see if I can relax him a bit, a little bit of flirtation. All right, then, let's give it a go. He kind of goes along with it a bit, and um, in a second, he will actually allow her to um, try and pull the, the, the table a bit. And this is a pretty, t there she goes, now she has a little bit of a go. But effectively, it's only when he leaves the table completely that um, she actually starts interacting with the table. And uh, this is, uh, this is a particularly nice um, video because I think it shows you quite nicely the type of interactions that are going on. And it's a fairly typical one. We actually also had a couple of males really becoming possessive and aggressive over the table um, to the point that we had to actually stop the, um, the test. So this is not, it's not the same kind of behaviors everywhere. But what you're seeing is a same pattern. And so what we did is we really sort of let, looked at the details of all the behaviors that were occurring during the test. And we excluded a lot of things. So first we thought, okay, maybe it's just the dominant that's pulling the rope and, this, and the subordinate individual doesn't even come close. No, actually the subordinate did come close. There was an equal amount of pulling. Um, and there was no species effect on the agonistic and aggressive interactions, but bear in mind there were very few aggressive interactions, so not very sort of meaningful. Um, and we didn't even find a difference between wolves and dogs in the amount of time they spent close to the apparatus. So the interest in the apparatus was pretty much the same. The motivation uh, was also the same because they took just as a little to just run it and go to, to, the, to the apparatus. So all of these were pretty much the same. What was different and what was strikingly different was that the wolves would arrive at the apparatus and then start doing things at the same time. Boom, 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 boom. And of course, that's the whole point. You've got to try to solve this thing. It's a problem solving task. When you don't know what to do, you've got to try lots of things. And then eventually you discover that if you both pull at the same time, then yay, that's the recipe for success. Instead, what we had with the dogs, it, they, they did a turn taking, right? One dog would go, do, 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 try, 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 give up and leave. The other one would arrive, try, 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 boom, give up and leave. 
Yeah, but the point is that you've got to do things together in cooperation, right? It's acting together for a common goal. And the dogs really had a problem with this. Okay, so we thought, let's try something else. <laughs> let's give the dominant dog in each pack a lot of experience of solving the task with a stooge, so one of our pet dogs, so that they get the idea that they really need the other individual um, to solve it. And then let's test them again with their, with their pack mates. So this is what we did. Um, and effectively, what's important to, to notice in the graph is forget the wolves for a moment. But if we then compared the performance of the dog in, in, in the inexperienced dyads, meaning that both individuals didn't really have a lot of experience of the task, then it was pretty bad. It improved quite drastically. Uh, if you had one individual that had had in the mixed experience dyads, um, so, so here, sorry, I should use my mouse, not my fingers. Uh, here, it improved quite drastically when one of the individuals had had a lot of experience with the pet dogs. So it seemed that this kind of allowed them then to accept the vicinity of their partner and do things together. Still, the wolves uh, outperformed the dogs, but this is not really what was interesting to us. The, what was interesting is that giving them this kind of experience allowed them to improve. Um, so, okay, so, so let's come a little bit to the conclusions about the conspecific cooperation. So what we can conclude from this is that, yes, it does seem that at the level of the species, the wolves outperform the, to the dogs, and this does uh, give some uh, support for this idea that the social ecology of dogs has changed, has moved away from conspecific cooperation. Um, but uh, what we kind of were interested also is to understand a little bit more about why the dogs struggle so much. And I couldn't go into huge details, but I just wanted to show you these videos um, because this is a test that we did on food tolerance, where we put a bowl of food, which is um, here where you see my indicator, with uh, just one single bowl of food and had two animals from the same pack released at the same time. So you have the wolves up here and the dogs down here. The bowl is here. And what you find, and this is published, ooh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to have the, the audio. But anyway, what you find, and this is published in Dale et al. 2017, is that the wolves will feed together. They, they, they can have pretty big arguments about it, right? You're going to hear a lot of growling. You didn't hear, but you can hear a lot of growling. But they will feed together. The typical behavior of dogs is this. Okay. So what we're talking about is conflict avoidance. It's that the dogs put in front of a resource don't want to go there. They don't want to have this conflict. They are avoiding the conflict. The wolves will happily have conflicts. <laughs> they don't have a problem with conflicts, okay? Um, I always kind of say that the wolves are really Italian. They like to argue, whereas you kind of have the dogs that are, have a bit more British, right? They're like, oh, no, 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 I don't want oh, to, no, wait, wait, I don't want to, I don't want to go there. And they had this kind of different style of deal with, dealing with conflicts. Um, and I think what we see in the cooperation task and the string pulling task is this. We, say this, we see the same mechanism in the other task. Um, and uh, so I, had a, I, I have presented this data many times now, and I always have the question at the end, uh, oh, but, you know, what if you do something different with the dogs. Oh, yeah, I am, I'm pretty sure that if we, or I, I, we haven't done it yet, we've got, we've got to write another project on cooperation, we haven't got around to it yet, but we will. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if we present dogs with a cooperation task that doesn't involve food, they will cooperate much more easily because it seems that where the problem lies is in cooperation for obtaining resources, for sharing resources. There, there is a problem. But for example, again, from the free-ranging dog studies, we know that they can cooperate very nicely uh, in guarding behaviors and keeping other packs away. So really, to, I, I want it to be very clear that this is, it's not co all types of cooperation. It is cooperation in a feeding task, yeah, where they have problems. Uh, okay, 
So then what did we do next? We said, fine, we don't, this one's out of the way. Let's move on to the next one. What about cooperation with humans? So same task, um, but we made it a bit, a bit more difficult now in the sense that, of course, it's a lot easier to ask humans to do things than to ask um, you know, a dog or a wolf to do something. So we uh, gave them again uh, the spontaneous cooperation. That's actually a wrong name because at this point they already had experience on this task. So it wasn't the first time. But let's, we, we gave them no training and we gave them the cooperation task with a human, first of all. Um, and then we also gave them um, uh, two apparatuses in the same um, field. So the, the human and the, the, the animal entered the field, but they had actually two apparatuses set in different places. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then we also did a delay condition, which I will explain in a minute. So let's start with the first. Oh, OK. So with the first one, with the spontaneous cooperation, uh, what we did is that we instructed the humans. Oh, first of all, the humans were all people that had raised the wolves and the dogs. So very, very close bond. Um, they had raised them from when they were puppies. So we asked the humans in 50% of the trials um, to arrive at the apparatus first, which means that we held the animals back and allowed the human to get there first. And we did this for two reasons. First of all is because the wolves and the dogs established a preference for a side during the experience that they had with uh, the conspecific. So by asking the human to arrive first, by manipulating the situation so that the human arrived first, we obliged the human to go to the preferred side of the animal. And this is because we were curious to see how flexible the wolves and the dogs would be in changing their behavior to accommodate the human preference. Um, so this is the first, the first reason. The second reason is because Effectively, we are interested in the animal behavior, not the human behavior. So the humans had a very strict set of rules. So they had to go there, stop. They had to count for, I, can't, I think it was five seconds, I can't quite remember. And then they had to start pulling at a specific rate. And, and, and this was because we wanted it to be very standardized and wanted to see then the animal, how they adapted to the human. Yeah. Not, we're not interested if the humans can adapt to the animals. We know that. Uh, okay, so what happened in the spontaneous cooperation? Actually, in the spontaneous cooperation, so sorry, in the in the uh, one tray cooperation, I should call it, um, both the wolves and the dogs did really well. Now, this is a bit striking because if you remember from my previous presentation, the dogs had done pretty badly with conspecifics. So the dogs started from a lower level than the wolves, yeah, because they had a lot less experience in the task. By the way, in, my, in all my models, I put the number of uh, trials that each diet had done, sorry, each individual had done pre in, in the, pre the conspecific tests, just so that that was accounted for. But nevertheless, that's not the, the, it's still striking because the dogs went from abysmal performance to actually doing pretty well, okay? So this was the first interesting uh, result. The other interesting result is that the wolves were pretty good with the humans as well. So they really didn't have any problems there. Um, and just, I, I love this video, so I have to show it. Oh, hmm, why do I suddenly have the, oh well. You just ignore what they're saying. So, um, you can actually see now, Christina. So this is, uh, they arrive simultaneously, I think, in this in this test. So she has to get there about halfway. And then we know that if she gets there halfway and we release the dog, then they arrive at the same time. And they do. <laughs> okay, thank you, um, Emiliano. So the reason I love this video is because I don't know if you saw Christina's uh, happy, 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 smiley face. Finally, the dogs have succeeded. And, you know, this is a study that we conducted over, I think, in the end, um, four years. So there was a lot of effort by everybody. So this was a really nice um, kind of uh, result, finally, for the dogs. 
Um, but again, it's not so much the success rate that is interesting. What is interesting is when you go and look at the details of the results. Um, and what you find is that not surprisingly, um, the animals were much more successful um, when they arrived themselves at the tray first because they could choose the side that they liked. They were good at waiting if they had to wait, but normally they didn't have to wait for very long because they, we, we kind of um, uh, made it so that the, the, the human arrived at the same time. Um, so, so this was kind of a quite an expected result. But what was really interesting to us was that when the humans arrived first and took, monopolized, if you want, the side of the, of the rope, the side of the tray that the animals preferred, then what we found was that the wolves were not that happy. So they would try to steal the rope from the humans. Um, they would do this sort of behavior of grabbing it away from the human hands. Um, whereas actually we only had two dogs that tried it and they only tried it once and then they, or once or twice. Okay, one of them five trial, trials, but then they sort of stopped immediately. Now the instructions to the people was do not, and this is kind of the World Science Center is based on, the whole World Science Center is based on this, do not enter in conflict with the animals, dogs and wolves. So the instruction was um, if the wolf or the dog steals the rope from you, drop drop it, step back, and the trial is a um, failure. So, but as you saw, the, the, the wolves did pretty well with the humans. Their success rate was pretty high. Yes, it was, because in the end, the number of times that they stole the rope and, and we had to sort of drop the, the, the trial is not so high that it affected the overall results. But still, it was a pretty striking difference. So what about, um, oh, oh yes, I forgot about this. Okay, so then we said, fine. Now the dogs are pretty successful with um, the, um, the humans. Um, so what happens if we retest them with dogs, right? Because come on, now, you know, they know, they know how to do it. They've learned. Uh, actually, we did this later. So this is, a, 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 I'm just putting it in here because it kind of fits nicely, but we did it a bit later after all of this study. And what happens is, Nothing. <laughs> so, okay, so here we have Binti. So the same dog that you saw happily doing it with Christine uh, and uh, Maisha, I think. And actually, so I'm sorry the view is not so great, but, but this was a bit of an error from the student, but we have another camera, but I couldn't find the video. But effectively, nothing. The two dogs are just going in opposite directions. And I mean, they know how to do it. They just did it, okay? So this was really striking for me. And unfortunately, we're unable to publish this data because there was only four diets that were left after all at this point in the, in the whole sort of thing. Um, but we, we, we are uh, writing a book now and it will go into the book. At least those results will go in the book. But for me, it was really striking the fact that they were still unable to do it. Okay, so then uh, the second uh, part of this study with the humans was with the two apparatus. So here you see the drawing of the enclosures and the two apparatuses. And um, here effectively you have a negotiation of what, where you go first, what you do first, and how you um, negotiate uh, this kind of novel because this was new um, set up for them. Um, and what we found is actually both the wolves and the dogs did really well. So they were able to solve um, both apparatuses, the wolves in 76 and the dogs in 67% of trials. So pretty good. But again, it's not so much the success that is interesting, but it's the details of the behavior. Because what we did is that we looked um, at uh, the um, choice of the animals. So, okay. So when they finished the first um, apparatus, which was always chose by the human, the, cho you, the human chose because they had it written down, we had to counterbalance everything. So the human would go to the first apparatus and the animals would follow. But then after that, there is a moment in which the animals have to choose what to do, um, whether to stop interacting, whether to go to the other apparatus, whatever they want to do. And we gave the instructions that the human should wait. Um, again, I can't remember if it was 10 seconds before they did something. And what we found was that the wolves, the dogs would actually wait for the human and uh, sort of stay there and sort of stand there next to them. Whereas the wolves finished one would boom, beelining to the other apparatus. The dogs would actually wait for the human to take the lead and to move towards the second apparatus and then they would follow. So this was already quite interesting, a small difference, but I think it's sort of leading to important 
uh, differences between wolves and dogs. The other aspect is I said, okay, what if we just take the trials where it's the human that moves first to the second apparatus? What do the animals do? And here again, it was really interesting because the dogs will follow and actually the wolves, meh, they lose interest and go off and do something else. So again, this, this kind of small differences that show that the style of cooperation of the wolves and the dogs is a little bit different in, with, um, with the humans. They seem to be less acceptant, uh, the wolves, of the leadership role of the human, or they maybe see themselves as, as equally likely to move and, and make choices. Yeah, okay, so actually this is exactly what I'm saying here. So, so okay, so what can we conclude from this study? Well, the first thing is that um, it does seem that actually once the wolves see humans as social partners, they are totally fine in cooperating with humans. So it's not that dogs cooperate better uh, because they have been selected for that. It's that um, normally we have wolves that are, you know, in a situation where they are not uh, they don't see humans as social partners, and so they have no reason to cooperate. In fact, most of the time they have reason to be afraid of humans. But if you remove that fear and you create the situation where you can test their actual cooperative abilities, then wolves can cooperate just fine. However, they do differ in their style. And um, we have some other data, which unfortunately isn't published yet, uh, that is making us kind of, and together with the data that I just presented, that is making us really think that uh, when wolves are cooperating with humans, they, they do it on equal terms in the same way that they do it with each other. They are not afraid of conflict and they are quite fine with just sort of saying, no, you can't do this. And uh, of course, you know, if a wolf says, no, you can't do this to a human, well, it might be a bit problematic. Okay. Um, and the dogs seem to avoid conflict with humans in the same way that they avoid conflicts with each other when there is a resource, a priori, if you want. So they don't even get there. So based on these kind of thinking and some of the other studies that we've done, we sort of um, threw out there what we call the, 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 I can't say it, the differential hypothesis of domestication, meaning that we likely selected a series of characteristics uh, in, our, in the dogs involuntarily um, that make them more likely to be submissive and accepting of human leadership and human choice compared to wolves. And if you think about kind of the domestication scenario, for example, human beings had open air kitchens, kitchen uh, for most of the domestication period of dogs. We did not have a kitchen in a house. We had a kitchen outside. And can you just imagine if you, instead of having a dog that you kind of go, no, you can't have that, and they just kind of leave, you have a wolf that insists on getting the food um, that is in your open air kitchen. This just would not have worked. You would have just killed that wolf, and end of story. So it's quite likely that through a natural process of wanting to live together, some of these uh, more sort of um, uh, pushy behaviors that we, we see in the wolves were simply eradicated in dogs and just are not there. Uh, Okie dokes, how am I doing? <laughs> okay, I still have about half an hour, I think. So let's move on. All right, so, uh, but what about this task, this cooperation task? I mean, what do the animals really understand? Do they know that they are cooperating with each other? Do they know that they need each other to cooperate? So this was the next question that we wanted to answer. Um, and again, important students that helped out, uh, Alex and Monica. Um, and uh, in order to sort of uh, think a little bit about how to uh, get to the animal's understanding, we chose to use two different conditions. One is the so-called delay condition. Um, now, the delay condition in the string pulling task is quite simple. You um, release one animal um, certain amount of time before the second animal so that to be able to succeed the first animal that is released who is the subject has to wait uh, a certain amount of time to, for the other one to arrive now the um the assumption of this condition is that um if the animal has realized that without his companion he's gonna fail then he will wait yeah if he recognized the need for the other, the other individual, 
uh, they will wait. And again, it, we didn't invent anything. This has, this has been used with lots of dis different species, as you can see here. And actually, chimps, elephants, capuchins, and kia did quite well in the late delay task, whereas rooks, ravens, and gray parrots didn't do so well. And um, the, uh, yeah, I, uh, it has also been used with wolves and dogs before. Uh, pet dogs in a study using the string pulling task could wait for each other, so with conspecifics, for about two seconds. And actually, in the very first study that I presented to you, so the conspecific study of uh, wolves and dogs, we were not able to do the delay task with the dogs because their performance was not good enough, but we did do it with the wolves, and we saw that um, the wolves could wait for 10 seconds for each other. Um, and uh, again, in a study done with pet dogs, not by us, uh, the pet dogs were able to uh, wait for 15 seconds for the human. So we decided that we would try and complete this picture a bit and do the study with the delay with the human, also with uh, the wolves. Um, and the reason we did, decided to do it with the humans uh, is because effectively, uh, we didn't want to put the dogs in the situation of working with other dogs again because we, we knew they wouldn't do it very well. Um, so we're, again, we were trying to level the playing field um, so that we're, we're now asking, do they understand the need for the partner? Um, and, and so the, it doesn't matter if the partner is a conspecific or a human because our question is, do they understand the need for a partner? And because with the humans, the wolves and the dogs were uh, performing nicely uh, at the same level, then we can ask this question in a fair manner to both of them. Um, and the result is, yes, they can wait. <laughs> both of them did, did quite nicely. Uh, so they didn't have huge problems in, they had an 88% success rate, so they, they didn't have any problems waiting 10 seconds for the human partner. So then uh, we said, okay, but let, let's, uh, an explanation for this could still be that over the course of all the various trials that they had, by this time they had quite a lot, it could still be that they simply have a very simple association rule. When my partner is there, I succeed. If my partner is not there, I don't succeed. So it doesn't really tell, does the delay task really tell me something about their understanding for the need of the partner? Or is it just an associative event where, okay, when my partner is there, I need to pull, and if he's not there, I need to wait. So we then said, okay, let's make it, um, let's try something else now. Let's try and give them a choice. Uh, and this is called the recruitment study because effectively um, what you, the, the typical way of doing it is that you have an apparatus that the animal can solve by themselves. So there's a rope in the middle and they can just pull that and the tray comes. And there is an apparatus where there's two ropes. So there you need the partner. And what you're doing is you're alternating the presentation of the solo and the cooperative apparatus. And then you sort of put the animal in the condition to choose whether to recruit their partner, so to whether to go and call one of their uh, pack mates or not. And this again has been done with a lot of different species in a lot of different ways, as you can see um, in the boxes, but I don't, I don't wanna go into the details of it, but it has been already done. So how did we decide to do it? So the first thing is that we gave all our, all our animals what we call marker training. So we had a, a marker, so just a wooden uh, yellow star that we put in front of uh, a door. Behind that door, there was the human partner. And we trained the animals that if they step on the marker, the door would open. So this was kind of the recruitment behavior because if they want the partner, they have learned through association that if you step on the marker, if you step on the star, the door opens and the partner comes out. So this was trained separately, yeah, in a kind of w without the same, without the, the apparatus. It was trained as a separate behavior. Then we gave them also experience of uh, the fact that now there's two apparatuses. There's a solo apparatus that you can solve by yourself by pulling the string in the middle, like you see in the photo here. Um, and then there is also the usual apparatus where you need your companion. So basically we trained them with a the marker, we gave them experience of the solo apparatus, and then we gave them the test. And in the test, what we did is um, that we had the setup with the table, 
um, the string pulling table that you hear, see here. Uh, you had the subject in one small enclosure and you had the human partner in another enclosure. And you had two markers, one in front of an empty enclosure and the other one in front of uh, the enclosure where the human was, or where the partner was. And these people here are, so, are the shifters, which basically are the people that I need to pull the rope to open the doors <laughs> so that you can kind of ignore them. So the animal, um, and, and, and then the other thing we did is that on some trials, we gave them the solo apparatus, and on some trials, we gave them the cooperation apparatus, so the, the one that needs two individuals. So they're basically the subject doesn't know which apparatus it is, so they need to go check out what it is, and then they need to decide what to do, whether to uh, go and call the partner, because this has two ropes, so it's the cooperation one, or um, just pull the rope by themselves. Um, and here I have a video. So here you see Yukon, uh, a wolf, in the solo uh, condition. So she trots around. You see the people, the shifters. That's the partner over there that she could recruit. But she's a smart cookie. She knows this is the solo one. So she pulls the rope and wanders back. Uh, this is Sahibu also with uh, the solo. Again, you see the person uh, at the back there. Um, he gets it as well, a little less forceful, but he gets there and eats it. Uh, and now you see the cooperation trial. So now this is, uh, she doesn't know it, of course, Yukon doesn't know it yet. Um, this is the tray, the, the cooperation tray, so the one with the two strings. So she comes up, she pulls it, but then stops, usual poor thing. They always tried it. And then she wanders off. So remember, there's two stars, but um, in one place, there is the person behind it. So you can see the star just here on the right-hand side, OK? And the, uh, the behavior is put two paws on the star, and the door opens. So she puts one paw. That's not enough. We're pretty strict with our animals. Uh, OK, then. All right, I'll put both. So then the shifter opens. Christine comes out and walks towards the table. And Yukon follows. And I think now they pull together and succeed. So you see already now how Yukon has a preference for one side of the table. So in this case, we didn't go against their preference. We, we always did it fine. Oh, wait, yeah, we have a dog as well. Um, here we go. So Sahibu uh, coming here. He also comes and has a look at the table, tries to pull, realizes, ah, it's the wrong one. It's not the solo one. Got to go. Uh, wanders back and puts his feet on the marker. And I think in this case, releases Marianne. And Marianne comes out and they solve it together. And of course, uh, the sides were back counterbalanced of all the people. I just realized that here, I somehow managed to choose um, videos that were all from the same side. The human was always on the same side, but they weren't. It was all counterbalanced. OK, and they solve it nicely. And of course, the, the trainers are fed up with eating sausage and, and they were getting saying that they were getting too overweight. So now they put the sausage in the pocket. But I think the whole thing is similar. OK, so what, what did we find? Again, uh, no difference in success rate um, uh, in between the wolves and the dogs. So this was nice. Um, what was interesting was that, yes, they did do a bit better in the solo com condition compared to uh, the cooperation condition which uh, makes sense. Um, there's a lot less work to do. It's a lot, a lot less difficult. Um, uh, but they did quite well also in the, in the cooperation um, trials. But again, uh, what was interesting is the details of the behavior. Because the first thing was that they all, they pretty much, in the majority of cases, visited the table. So went and had a look at the table before making decisions. And what is interesting is that they also quite often pulled the table, uh, the, um, the rope, uh, when they actually got there. And they did a little bit what uh, you see, um, you saw Yukon do, which is they gave a little bit of a pull. 
um, almost to try and figure out what was going on and then made the choice. Um, and uh, we found effectively that they, but that nevertheless, despite this, um, we actually found that they uh, pulled the table uh, much more in the solo compared to the cooperation condition, um, probably because they felt the pull behind it and then went for it. Um, and also they felt there was a de decrease of pulling in the cooperation trials. So over time, they seem to start understanding, um, based on visual discrimination alone, uh, which was the cooperation and which was the solo table. Um, uh, but this kind of required uh, some sort of learning procedure. When it comes to stepping on the marker, um, what we were surprised was that they actually only did it in about 50% uh, of trials. Uh, when they did step on the marker, they stepped on the correct marker, so it wasn't a, pre a question of discrimination. Um, but effectively, it, was, it wasn't in that many trials that they did it, only about half of the time. Um, and in 13 of, out of 15 animals, uh, they did recruit the uh, partner more in the cooperation than the solo trials. But still, they didn't do it very much. So they did it, it's, it's, it, they did it in the correct uh, settings, and they did do it but not very much. And this we were definitely surprised about because um, it was kind of a counterintuitive uh, result that they're doing it correctly when they're doing it, but they're not doing it very much. Um, so, so why? W what, is, what is the issue? And actually one thing we thought about is that they might be just extraordinarily lazy. Um, and the reason we, we kind of got this is because you might have also seen it a little bit with Yukon in the video, there's this kind of trotting over there, but <laughs> not particularly enthusiastically. It's almost like the amount of work that they have to do is too much compared to the reward they're getting. So we did an additional sort of um, test where we shifted the position of the people. So you still have the table here, but now to recruit the person, you just have to go from here to here rather than go all the way back to, at the end of the enclosure. And actually, surprisingly, we found that they did quite a lot better uh, and their success rate actually increased. They did a lot more recruiting behavior in this kind of final uh, situation where there was a less effort involved. So it seemed that it wasn't, it really wasn't a, a sort of lack of understanding, but just um, a lack of motivation to really complete the task. Um, okay, so then what can we conclude? Well, um, the, in the delay condition, both the wolves and the dogs did really nicely. Uh, so we didn't have any problems there. Um, they did actually a lot better than uh, the pet dogs did in, uh, in the previous study. And this might be a difference of the setup, or it might be uh, also the fact that our dogs are quite used to working uh, in a lot of different environments. And so there's a learning to learn process going on. Um, when it comes to recruitment, the recruitment part, uh, we found that wolves and dogs discriminated between the solo and the cooperation apparatus, and they just really nicely adjusted their behavior accordingly. And I think this, at least for me, the recruitment condition is a stronger evidence of un the animal's understanding that they needed a partner in these trials compared to the delay. The delay doesn't really convince me. The recruitment one starts to go in the direction of convincing me that they actually know that there there is some partnership necessary involved in these kind of behaviors. Um, yeah. So finally, and I think I, I, I can manage to get there and present the last one. Um, is this correct? Yeah, I still have about 10 minutes. Just, just, just wanted to confirm. Yeah, just make sure, uh, make sure you leave some time for the questions as well yes. here, and not only the Alpha Hawa, in the in the other room ah okay all right so then uh, i'll try and be super quick with this one it, it really is a, a just a, a sort of a meta-analysis so um and this was very much uh uh well actually rachel and i worked a lot on this together this was quite fun to do so rachel was uh, one of my ex phd students actually at this point she was a postdoc um, and we had a lot of fun with this so so one of the beauties of the wool science center is that we have at this point 
a, a lot of information about our animals, um, about their relationship, but also about their cognitive skills. So we said, okay, well, what is this? Um, it, what is really affecting the behavior of the animals in this cooperation task? Is it their cognitive abilities or is it social relationships? And uh, based on all the studies that I'm kind of uh, putting here, uh, we had scores for our animals on how fast they learned, uh, so learning speed, and how good they are at inhibitory control, uh, meaning which is involved in the cooperation task because inhibitory control is the ability to wait and to stop yourself from doing something that is very impulsive. So you can imagine that this ability, this self-control ability, uh, is important when you're trying to not pull the rope. Uh, we also had uh, information about their co cause effect comprehension and their persistence. So how uh, how much they would continue trying to solve the task um, in, in a specific situation. Um, and this was for the cognitive abilities, the cognitive measures that we had of all our individuals. And then we also had a lot of information about uh, the relationship between our animals. So the affiliation scores. So here you see two wolves grooming each other. And grooming is one of the behaviors that we use to indicate the affiliation score. Uh, we also know all the dominance relationship between our individuals. So uh, and, and therefore the rank distance between them. So here you see Tala and Shima having a, a bit of a, a, a sort of a decision on who is dominant and who is not. And I, I don't think I have to tell you who's the dominant one. Um, and of course, as you saw before, uh, we have data on all our uh, tolerance tests. So uh, how likely and how willingly two individuals would feed uh, next to each other. So we thought, okay, we have all this data on all these different factors. Which of these factors is important in cooperation? And we actually also had three different measures uh, of uh, cooperation. We had the coordination task, uh, which is the one I just presented, to you, what we called here the coordination task, which is the string pulling task. But we also had a prosociality task where the wolves could actually feed their pack mates um, by uh, pressing the correct uh, icon on a touch screen. Uh, and we had an inequity avoidance task. Now, I don't have time to go into all of them, so I'm not going to go into details. But what, so, so let's just focus on the string pulling task. And what is interesting is that we did a meta analysis on all the non social factors that I just mentioned and all the social factors that I mentioned um, and how they affected the success in this is the string pulling task I talked about today. So the coordination one here in the middle and the other two tasks. And what emerged, emerged really sort of quite strikingly and quite strongly is, is that it's really the social factors that are important. So the closer the affiliation between two individuals, and this is just for the wolves, this is an analysis was done only for the wolves. The closer the affiliation uh, between individuals, the better they cooperate the more they give to the end and, and the more they give to the other. But OK, this is I didn't present today. Um, the rank distance also had uh, an impact. So the smaller the rank distance between two individuals, the more they cooperated. Um, and actually, tolerance strangely didn't have um, uh, an effect on the coordination task, but it did on inequity aver aversion. Um, now, I know it's, it's a little bit fast. But the reason I wanted to present this, this last little bit of information is for two reasons. First is because it's incredibly rare to be able to have this quantity of data to be able to look at all these aspects together and really compare them. And I think this is one of the great strengths of the World Science Center is the possibility of collecting all of this data and, and you know, periodically trying to figure out what's going on at a broader level. Um, and, and the second is because we often, so uh, also the, the title of, of, of your invitation was, you know, come and talk about social cognition. And this is really interesting because social cognition is kind of a hybrid, right? It, it, it assumes that there is a lot of cognitive capacities involved, but also that there is something social, so, social relationships within that uh, cogni cognitive aspect. And here it was really a, a sort of, let's try and tease them apart. And then what happens? And actually what happens is that it seems that the emotional part, if you want, sort of the social part, uh, was the one that actually uh, affected all the behaviors a lot more. Um, 
And with that, uh, there are, of course, always limitations. And our biggest limitation is that we are in a captive setting. We have no idea how uh, things would pan out in a non-captive setting. And we have the enormous, huge constraint of very small sample sizes. I tried to indicate all the sample sizes in the studies. And unfortunately, they are embarrassingly small sometimes. And there ain't much I can do about that, I have to say. Um, the whole enterprise is very costly and it's very difficult to be able to uh, work with more animals. The ways that we are trying to um, overcome these limitations is by working with lots of different populations. Um, so we work with pet dogs as well. Uh, we work with Morocco free-ranging dogs. Uh, we are able to do a lot of cognitive tests and social tests with the, co with the free-ranging dogs. Uh, we're actually starting to do that something also with the wild wolves in Italy as well. Um, so these are kind of the ways in which we're trying to sort of counter some of the, of the limitations. And, the, and these are also the future directions of our work, I think. And with that, um, I, I can never stress enough that the, the, I have the privilege of working at the World Science Center and the privilege of taking credit for all this amazing work by presenting it. But honestly, I mean, it's a, it's a hugely collaborative enterprise and it depends on a lot of people uh, from the trainers who care for the animals uh, and really help us in all our studies to all the administration staff that um, you know, give us the time and space to do science. Um, I th don't think I would have any time and space uh, to do science if it weren't for them. Um, and of course, all the fantastic students and volunteers, uh, postdocs and PhDs that I have had the privilege to work with. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Very, very, very brilliant and very interesting uh, presentation. Thanks was very stimulating. So let's see if we have any any question here before, as you know, we move to another separate room to work specifically on with the <clears throat> students in our behavioral ecology class. So, oh, there is a question. So the, the, the question is about what if, <laughs> well, you can read it, <laughs> go for it. All right. Um... <laughs> Do you have about two million to answer that question, please? <laughs> okay, what is your take? What is your feeling, your gut feeling? Uh, okay, so I, I, I can give you a little bit of an answer. So um, the, um, a brilliant researcher called um, Ferdinand Pelsen um, actually did that uh, at the University of Kiel. They raised, the, uh, the, together with Zeman, they raised um, uh, wolves and dogs, um, poodles actually, uh, big poodles, the, the standard poodles. And in part of their experience, what they did is that they um, had mixed uh, groups of wolves and dogs. And what was pretty extraordinary was that very counterintuitively, and unfortunately a lot of this work is forgotten, although we, we try very hard to mention it every time we have do presentations, is that by the age of four months in her poodle and wolf pack, um, the male poodles were all dominant over the uh, wolves. Um, and this is very counterintuitive again, right? What we think is that wolves are always going to be the, the top dog somehow, that their sociality is much more sort of hierarchical and so forth. Uh, actually, what, what she found was that this was not the case. So this is kind of one part of the question. The other, uh, or the answer, the other part of the answer I can give, and this is if the question is about, you know, the cultural part, right? Because, I mean, animals are not just animals. They also have a huge learning. And uh, there were some fantastic studies done with uh, macaques uh, where rhesus macaques and Tonkin macaques, now I can't remember what the other one was, but they're two vastly different um, styles, dominant styles. So one is the sort of more tolerant and the other one is the more despotic species. They were uh, cross-raised. And actually, um, the what happens in this kind of cross-raising is that effectively uh, part of the, 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 um, the psyche of the species remains, but actually there is also a huge influence of the social environment. And that is a super interesting question, which I, you know, if you have two million to give me to answer it, I would immediately go for with the wolves and the dogs because they do have a different social style. Having said that, it's not so different um, as, for example, the Tonkins and, and the rhesus macaques. 
And actually, I think that it might be strongly affected by their social ecology. And this is the other big question that I have that I would love to be able to, and I'm kind of trying to go in that direction, is to actually study different populations of dogs that have a different dependence on each other um, and see what varies in, for example, their cooperative abilities once the environment, that meaning also the social environment, requires them because they are dependent on each other for, for um, whatever it is, for survival or whatever. Yeah. Does that answer the question a little bit? I think so. <laughs> yeah, that, to me, yes. Okay, good. Um, we, oh, yeah, there's uh, this. Uh, uh, if you if you had to choose uh, to 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 do the testing on cooperation in Europe, it's and, been done. I think something is, must have been done. Must have, yeah. Yes. So the the string pulling task has been used also with children. Um, I'm afraid I'm a little bit out of date on the literature, so I don't quite know um, uh, what the results are, and I also don't quite know what the questions there were. So I would have to go and look at it again. Um, but but no, I mean humans, you know, are pretty cooperative species. Where where things get interesting is more on the prosociality tasks, because of course cooperation tasks, you're getting something out of it, and you really need someone else to do something to get for you to get something out of it. Prosociality is a bit different. Prosociality, you're actually working for some someone else, and and actually we did these studies also with the wolves and the dogs, and we did it with the kids as well, but it wasn't a complete study. Uh, and they're the kids, yeah, they're not, they're, you know, not quite, not quite as pro-social as we kind of like to think. So it, it depends very much on, surprise, surprise, social relationships. Um, so, you know, they will give uh, food to their best friend, but yeah, maybe not the other person. So so I think a lot of the social factors that we find affecting cooperation and prosociality in our dogs and wolves are actually the same ones that affect prosociality and, and cooperation in humans. Um, Although perhaps humans are also willing to cooperate with complete strangers, which I think might be the big difference, because yeah, I certainly don't see a wolf uh, um, um, cooperating with a complete stranger. But you only you only tested the ad adult adults, right? In your yeah yeah okay. Uh, there's some more questions uh, by Marco Salvatori. Uh, do you think your results challenge the traditional knowledge of a strict hierarchy in wolves, and so, uh, wolves society? Um, yes, no. So uh, I would say that, so uh, definitely wolves are structured as a family pack, this we know. Um, yes, they can, they also do accept non-family members. So um, this is also uh, quite clear, but there is a very strict hierarchy in, in, in the wolves, in wolf packs. So uh, for example, we were very, very lucky to be able to have um, a student studying uh, a litter of um, wolf puppies actually in, in nature uh, here in Italy um, by observing them from very far away. And, um, and, and uh, when you do the calculations looking at the uh, David score and the various uh, dominance indexes, also within litters there, are, there is already at five months uh, a pretty clear hierarchy. So... Um, Unfortunately, I think hierarchy has a very bad name for itself. It's considered a bad thing to have a hierarchy, but uh, actually it's very functional. The reason hierarchies exist is to make a pack work well together. Uh, and it's the same for humans. I mean, a, a, a strict hierarchy can work very well. A strict hierarchy doesn't mean that you don't respect each other. It doesn't mean that you don't cooperate with each other and that you don't listen to each other. But it does mean that you each have a very clear role in um, in the kind of structure and in the society that you live in. And wolves definitely have that. And so do dogs. Um, both have very clear um, hierarchies. So no, I don't think it completely um, overthrows the traditional knowledge. The traditional knowledge is pretty sound. Uh, any more questions? Uh, Luca Pedruzzi is one of our students in behavioral ecology, actually. No, he was. Uh, now is uh, I think he's uh, Elisabetta students, master of science students, right? Yeah. Were the wolves used in the study as part of the first generation to be human raised? If not, that could the question that I had myself. If not, could the presence of gener of n generations of wolves acquainting to humans select the same traits present in dogs? Hang on, I'm not entirely sure if I get it. Uh, were our wolves the first ones to be hand raised? Now, I think you mentioned the generation. How many generation of hand raised? 
So it was uh, the first time that those wolves were hand raised or they were uh, the, the F1 of uh, hand raised uh, parents. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I got that's it. My, um, that's my interpretation because I had the same question. So it's a bit more complicated than that. So all our wolf puppies come from captive settings. Um, most of them are from wolf parks in America. Um, and most of these wolf parks do not hand raise their animals. So they are, um, uh, so, so our uh, animals were hand raised, but they were the daughters or sons of non hand raised, non human hand raised animals. Um, I think there might have been one exception, um, but I'm not entirely even sure. I think the father was hand raised and the mother not, but in general, they were not hand raised. Okay. Uh, the dogs, another matter, of course. So the dogs yeah. come from shelters. Oh, but this is also interesting. So we, we had the genetic analysis done on all our dogs and their genetic profile is basically equivalent to free ranging dogs coming from Eastern Europe. And the dogs that we try, the puppies that we tried to select from these shelters in Hungary were from street dog, were from street dogs. Um, the, but we have an exception, and this gets complicated to explain, but we have an exception because one, the last generation of dogs we raised were, uh, the, uh, were the offspring of our own females at the War Science Center. So in this case, um, the situation was a little bit different. And this was a choice we made, but I don't know if you want to, if, 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 I mean, I can go into it now, but it, it was basically a choice we made because we found that our dogs were not, are not very good at living with other dogs in packs. Um, and uh, with hindsight, we should have guessed it because we asked around lots of different places, do you have dogs living in packs? And everybody's like, no, not possible, no, not possible. Uh, or it is possible, but only if you castrate them, we don't want to castrate them, of course, because then change your behavior. So. <clears throat> But effectively, we were having big problems. And so we thought, OK, maybe if we raise our own litters and it's a family pack, then the levels of aggression will stay down once they become uh, sexually active and we have female in the heat. The answer is no. They are just as um, uh, aggressive. So one of the big differences, and I think it's probably the only one, except oh no, the other big difference is the feeding regime, which is, has to be different for a medical reason, well, for physiological reasons in the wolves and the dogs. So, but one of the big differences is that in the last four years, we resigned to the fact that we have to separate our males uh, when they have a female in heat, because otherwise they kill each other. Well, not quite, yep. but. They get pretty mm -hmm. close. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yes. with, with the wolves, we don't have any problems. Their hierarchy is nice and linear and strict, and it's just the alpha male. And you know, yeah, we can keep and, them together. Uh, even. Mm -hmm. No problem. Here it is another question from uh, from one of our um, PISA students, Donato Sorano. Uh, what about cooperation, conflicts, avoidance in free ranging uh -huh. dogs? In your opinion, would they perform a wolf-like manner or in a pet-like one? Uh, uh, I so, trying to specify one thing because free-ranging and feral dogs are pretty different. But you said that there's no such a thing of feral dogs. No, no, no. There is, there is. Uh, so free-ranging okay. is normally used as an umbrella yeah. term, which includes feral dogs. And the okay. word feral dogs is normally referred to dogs that um, do not, uh, so live far away from humans, are unhabituated to humans or have lost the habituation of humans, however you want to see it. And that uh, mostly um, sub live off um, hunting and yeah. very little subsistence. Um, yeah. The reason I said that, so unfortunately, um, domestic dogs so because then the other problem is that sometimes you use the word feral dogs also for dingo and 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 for new guinea singing dogs which is another thing again because they're not yeah, yeah, yeah. no the i same. was thinking more <laughs> of the domestic dogs that went feral yeah so um what what i what i'm actually saying is that i don't know of any uh group of domestic dogs that went feral that live completely off hunting and okay. if you do know of any, please let me know, because I am desperate to study them. <laughs> and so what about Donato's question? What do you think? Um, so 
so this is kind of where I was going with the social ecology part. So I, th I would find it extremely interesting to present cooperation tasks to different populations of free ranging dogs that differently depend on each other for their existence. And free ranging dogs offer that opportunity. So where we're going now is um, trying to develop cooperation tasks or where we will be going, because at the moment we've got too many open projects. But one thing that we would like to do is to really sort of design cooperation tasks that can be given to free ranging dogs that are living in very different environments. And um, in Morocco, for example, I mean, at the moment, our study site is a beautiful place um, on, on the beach and it's very easy and the dogs have a fantastic life. But actually, we, we have identified another, um, another group of dogs that live up in the Atlas Mountains. And they are almost feral in the sense that they're very non-habituated to humans, although they come down to the villages to feed at night. So they do the same thing the wolves do or the urbanized wolves do. Um, and we would love to be able to sort of test that because although they don't hunt together, they depend on each other a lot for warmth because they're up in the mountains and it's bloody cold. So they, they, they have a kind of a necessity to, for that group living that I think the, that some of the other populations of dogs don't have. So I don't know how to answer your question. Sorry, Donato. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would love to kind of uh, be able to answer it, but at the moment, I don't have the data to do so. Um, so, uh, oh, another one. This is uh, another of our students, Lorenzo. Uh, is about cooperation. More common, more problematic compared to wild wolves. Uh, problematic, problematic. Mm. Is cooperation between Henry? Oh, okay. Yes. Well, it's the same thing again. Um, so, if they depend on each other, are they going to be more willing to cooperate? Yes, I, I, I might. That would be my um, hypothesis, um, mm -hmm. uh, or and or my strong prediction. But uh, I think it's important to to sort of uh, think about this. Um, the Wolf Science Center puts the wolves and the dogs in the same condition, right? So, so our main que the Wolf Science Center was not born to answer all que uh, questions. The, the Wolf Science Center was born to answer one question, <laughs> which is if you eliminate as much as possible the environmental differences between wolves and dogs, what's, what, what remains there? What is left? What are the, diff the core differences? Now, my suspicion is that um, dogs have one huge advantage which is incredible flexibility. But this flexibility comes at a big cost in the sense that if things are not necessary, I don't have to keep doing them. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm get, getting at? So if you put them in a different environment, in a different context where they need to cooperate because otherwise they die, I'm pretty sure that they will cooperate. But it's no longer one of the primary um, psychological uh, um, uh, pillars of dog cognition, if you want, or, or of dog, it's not even cognition, it's more of dog um, existence. For wolves, it's still like that because their social ecology is still highly dependent on that. Yeah. So by comparing in the, the Wolf Science Center, in a sense, you're saying, how important is cooperation for this piece, for these two species, when you remove the actual need for it? Because also our wolves don't need to cooperate at the Wolf Science Center. We feed them. They don't hunt. Does okay. that answer your question, Lorenzo? Uh, I, I can't. Yeah, okay. He can't um, say yes or no. But. Um, yes. So... Um, I would have a, a question that I received by phone. I see that there is another question by Samuele. Actually, Milano, if you can write it and report it. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had ah, um, are more independent of human collaboration? Uh, the answer is no. We did one study. I, I'm just trying to remember what breeze we had in that study. So we did one study on in inequity avoidance, comparing breeds, and we had independent breeds and cooperative breeds. And the independent breeds were the Nordic breeds, so not the Marimani, but the um, Huskies and all of those. And the cooperative breeds were the Retrievers and the Shepherds, I think. And actually, we didn't find any differences in their response to inequity but we did find differences in their response to how willing how willing they were to work for free 
<laughs> <laughs> so, so the Nordic breeds were not pretty pretty willing not were not very willing to work for free. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, but no, sorry, no no studies on different uh, breeds. Okay, so we we don't have any more question from the YouTube channel, but I received a question that is actually uh, I'm sure you 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 heard this a lot of times, but I think it's very important to 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 report it to you. So what about uh, what what are the um, expectation? What are your expectation um, on uh, the differences between wolves and wolves hybrids with dogs that are pretty common, for example, in Italy. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about whether they behave differently or not. And uh, so far, at least uh, uh, telemetry results, so they are not very precise, of course, in profiling the behavior, but at least the spatial behavior uh, and uh, other kind of uh, behaviors that are being inferred from, uh, from uh, tagging you know, with the GPS colors, these animals, could not detect any significant difference. What is your take? Would you expect a pack of wolves that has that has hybridized with the with dogs to actually behave differently than a pack of wolves that live in the same situation, an ecological situation that is a pure uh, wolf? Um... Can I have another two million and can I tell you in two years time? <laughs> no, okay, uh, no, 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 let me, no, I, I'll, I will try and answer it. So um, again, uh, Featherson Pedersen, so Featherson Pedersen also did this, she did everything, uh, she's really cool. Um, so they had uh, Puwos, Puwos were um, mixed poodles and wolves and they studied uh, the behavior of the mixed poodles and wolves. Uh, of course they studied the, be the social behaviors um, and not so much the kind of behaviors that I think you would be interested in uh, in relation to um, the hybrid problem that, that we have in Italy, okay? Because I think the whole point of the, um, the hybridization issue is the question of whether they become more confident with humans. I think this is the underlying big question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, do they become more confident with you, confident with humans? Do they come closer to um, the, uh, you know, to the human habitation and so forth? And uh, honestly, I don't know. I think there are ways of testing it. And actually, we just won a project um, uh, to do that, uh, but not so much with high, well, also with hybrids. Uh, but with wild wolves. So we are looking at neophobia uh, in wild wolves in Italy, mm. uh, including hybrids, because of course there are quite a lot. Um, but the project has just started. We're still trying to figure out exactly how to do these things. But I think uh, it will be fantastic to, to sort of look at this. And this is together with um, uh, the University of Sassari, uh, with um, Marco and uh, Marco Polonia and Massimo Scandura. So I think we will go a little bit in that direction of finding out these things. Um, at the moment, uh, I think that for me, and I'm ignorant uh, about genetics, I mean, this is not my field. I, I, luckily, I, I have the good fortune of collaborating with geneticists that can help me. But at the moment, I find it very difficult to have scientific background to give that answer because of a number of reasons. First, the number of studies done on gene behavior um, association, even in dogs, are very, very few. Um, and uh, as yes, there are a couple of studies that show that there are genetic links between uh, neophobia uh, and aggressiveness and, and there is a genetic underpinning of these behaviors. Um, but on wolves, there is nothing. And uh, the assumption that the, that the exact same um, uh, uh, SNPs would be responsible in both wolves and dogs is, is, a, is, an, is that, it's an assumption. So this is the first problem. So we still don't even know exactly which genes are responsible for what kind of behaviors. So, um, so this is the first thing. The second thing is how do you define a hybrid, right? Because an F1, okay, fine. That's an easy hybrid to, to, to categorize as a hybrid. But uh, what about the back cross one? Mm, back cross two, mm, back cross three? Mm. So again, uh, you have a complexity on both sides. You have the complexity of defining the behaviors, a complexity of defining what a hybrid is, and the complexity of linking genes to behaviors. 
So the only way you could answer these questions, I think, is really either you create um, a sort of a setting where you have hybrids and non-hybrids and compare them on their behavior, but you've got to be sure that the environment is exactly the same. You have to create another World Science Center where you have hybrids and non-hybrids. And then maybe you could start saying, okay, F1s, they do. Back cross ones, meh, they're beginning to lose it. Oh no, back cross ones, it's even more. Wait, but the genetic diversity of these back cross ones is going to be influenced also by the parent. Yeah, Ooh. it's a nightmare. Yeah. Nightmare. Okay, so for the sake of time, I would like to ask Elisabetta if she has any question, because I, I completely excluded her from the, the <laughs> discussion. Okay, yes, I have a, a couple of questions. The first one is about feral dogs. And uh, I was wondering if there is any decision-making process before engaging in, in intergroup attacks and uh, if such decision-making can follow the rule or the hypothesis formulated by Richard Wrangham about the unbalance of power hypothesis, so the difference between uh, numerosity of the different uh, packs. Uh, the answer is yes, but I didn't do the study. It's Roberto Bonanni who did the study. Um, so uh, I think it was Bonanni until 2010 or 2011. I can send it to you. So, um, and as far as I know, that is the only... So oh, no, and then there's a study in wolves, but you asked me about dogs. Um, uh, as far as I know, that's the only study that has been done uh, on this. And yes, what he found was that two things played uh, a role. The first thing that played the role was the numerosity of uh, the pack members. Um, so uh, bigger packs chose to engage. <laughs> um, uh, if, if, if the difference between their packs and the other packs um, was, was sufficient, I can't remember what, what, it, what the ratio was. But if there was a certain ratio, uh, then the uh, more numerous pack would, would um, initiate the, uh, the inter-pack uh, confrontation. Um, and the other one, which is super interesting, is that it depended on the relationship in the sense that if you had close affiliative partners in your pack, so your most close affiliative partners were present at that moment when you met the other uh, pack, then you would be more, you were more likely to engage. So again, social relationships came out as super, super important. Yes. So alliances in that sense. So alliances are extremely important if you have in your pack at that moment uh, a higher number of friends, uh, you can rely on their help. Yeah. Maybe something like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And another uh, another question. It is possible that the refuse to cooperate in dogs could be linked to their level, their low level of trust in each other. I mean. Uh, if they behave unfairly during their daily activities, it is possible that it can affect their ability to cooperate each other. Yeah, so um, I should have gone into that a little bit more. So the first thing that we kind of wondered about was if the general um, relationship between our dog pack, uh, between yeah. the dogs in our packs, was near compared to the wolves being, you know, really sort of uh, close. Um, and the only way we could kind of answer that question is because we do observations on our animals, we create affiliation scores and we do it exactly in the same way. And, uh, and the affiliation score is basically based on the exchange of affiliative interaction between two individuals. So for each diet, uh, normalized by observation time, blah, blah. Um, so for each diet, we had an affiliation score. And um, actually what we found was that um, the affiliation scores between our wolves and the, our dogs didn't differ. So this was kind of reassuring that it wasn't what, reassuring. I don't know. Anyway, this was kind of excluded the fact or excluded in our heads the, the fact that it was just that our dogs really have bad relationships with each other. They don't. They actually have uh, quite nice relationships with each other, but they don't translate into cooperation. Uh, the other interesting thing is, and unfortunately, this is also unpublished data. I mean, eventually we'll get to publish all this stuff, hopefully, um, is that actually we kind of thought, okay, maybe they have the same affiliation score, but maybe they're just not so affiliative in general. So maybe the wolves show a lot more affiliative behavior to each towards each other. It turns out this isn't, isn't the case either. So if you look at purely the frequency of affiliative behaviors in wolves and dogs, again, normalized by observation time, they don't differ. 
Uh, the only thing that does differ is the number of subordinate uh, relationships, uh, not relationships, uh, behaviors. Uh, and actually, wolves show more than dogs. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, interesting. But uh, maybe beside the point. So this is kind of the two ways that we, we kind of tried to look at it. Um, having said that, and this is more kind of from the personal experiences, um, uh, the free-ranging dogs are something else. So our captive animals, they don't behave like the free-ranging dogs, or they don't have the same quality of relationships. But this, I can't really say scientifically now, because we don't have the data to back that. But the feeling is that there are certain... Uh, and I mean, our, the free ranging dogs that we see are very diverse. Some don't have any relationship with any dogs. They're pretty solitary. Uh, others kind of go around in diets, others form packs. So it's, it's incredibly varied. It's, it's a huge, it's, it's much more varied than what you, you would expect. I, we didn't expect it. It's really, you see everything. But sometimes you see really, really strong relationships where two individuals just stick together and not necessarily two individuals of different sexes. Actually, normally it's two individuals of the same sex. Exactly. Stick together and really sort of do a lot together. And that kind of bond, I don't think we've seen. But I don't think we see uh, in, the, in the captive setting. But I'm not entirely sure that you see it that often in the, in the free ranging setting either. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. The microphone, Ale. Um, sorry, I have to, for the sake of time, I have to interrupt this uh, very interesting dialogue. <laughs> on uh, ethology, and um, and um, we need to move in the other room for the, yep. the class. So I really want to thank Sarah uh, for giving this fantastic speech, and Elisabetta for inviting Sarah and offering to us the opportunity to listen to this very in, uh, interesting and important um, uh, topics. So uh, thanks again, Sarah, and. Uh, uh, I hope to see you soon uh, with us. Uh, okay. uh, so I just moved to the other to the other room, right? To Teams. Yes, exactly, yes. exactly. Yes. Okay. Thanks All right. And Perfect. Thanks, thanks a lot. For attending. Bye bye. Right. You have a lot of compliments there. <laughs>